All eyes are on Apple Incorporated after they reported their Q4 results ending their fiscal 2024 and shares are sliding one and a quarter percent in the after hours. That is despite being down close to 1.8 percent on the regular trade. We'll take a look at the numbers and see why they actually weren't that bad over at Apple. They came in with a double beat. You also continue to see revenue growth. But when we take a look at the all important greater China region, yeah, that's a country where growth, at least on the top line, has absolutely come to a screeching halt. And year over year, you're actually seeing meaningful declines in that part of the business. And then we'll take a look at the different news as it pertains to Apple. A lot of new products coming out over at Apple in terms of the MacBook. Also, of course, the iPhone 16, as well as those Apple intelligence AI features. And then when we get over to the technicals, this one, you stretch it out over a long, long period of time. And yeah, you've done phenomenal with shares of Apple right now. You're a bit overextended. And so you're seeing that pullback in the after hours, just a 1.2% decline. We'll see maybe where shares can be a buying opportunity if you continue to see this decline in shares of Apple. Hey guys, hope you're doing well out there. If you haven't hit the subscribe button below, be sure to do that. These videos really, really take a while to put together and your support would be much appreciated. Year to date, shares of Apple up a cool 20%, actually doing pretty well, performing relatively in line with the market up over the 35% over the past one year. Keep in mind, you continue to get a yield with this one that they just declared as well of 25 cents. That's on a quarterly basis. So you annualize that. You're looking at a dollar that they continue to increase year over year pretty consistently, in my opinion. Now, revenues in this most recent Q4 came in at $94.9 billion. That is good for 6% growth year over year, beating estimates by a small half a billion dollars. Now, I would be more impressed with $94 billion of revenue in a quarter, but unfortunately, I just took a look at the Amazon report and they put up something close to 100, 150 billion dollars in top line revenues. And so this 94, not nearly as impressive. So sorry about that, Apple, but Q4 bottom line EPS coming in at $1.64, beating estimates by a small four cents. So really in line, I'd say both on the revenue and earnings side. Now they again declared that cash dividend of 25 cents a share that's on a quarterly basis. The important thing to know with Apple is they really taking an approach that's different to all of the other big techs. They're certainly driving a lot of operating cash flow, nearly $27 billion in a quarter. But what they instead are doing is returning pretty much all of that to you, the shareholder, in the form of buybacks and dividends. So they're not like these other tech companies that are investing heavily back into themselves, back into CapEx, back into AI build out. They're instead handing you the money, the shareholder, for you to maybe go out and spend on a nice watch, on a nice dinner, maybe even the new iPhone itself. Now, if we look ahead to the upcoming quarters, Apple doesn't provide solid guidance for the upcoming quarters or upcoming year. They instead just, you have to sort of take analyst word or analyst numbers for it, which as we saw in the Amazon video, not really that great in terms of trusting what analysts think a company will do in the near future. But at least the average estimate on Wall Street is for a $128 billion upcoming Q1, which is again, Apple's Q1, but it's the calendar Q4, also known as the holiday quarter. And so certainly that huge, huge spike in revenue is what you expect, at least on a sequential basis, year over year, expecting roughly 6.7% growth year over year. The high end is for 135. So that's a pretty big range from 123 to $135 billion. Certainly a lot of that lies on how well the iPhone 16 sells, also how well the new line of MacBooks will sell. Certainly we'll get into those news stories in just a second, but from this most recent quarter, you saw growth really across the board outside of greater China. So in China, you're seeing a slowdown. Maybe some of that is due to Apple themselves, but I think a lot of that is due to competition from companies like Huawei, where they're producing phones that fold in two, phones that even fold in three, and Apple sticking to their flagship iPhone that's really looked the same over the last five, maybe even 10 years, that maybe just isn't selling well to the Chinese consumer, at least anymore. Because over the last 12 months, you're seeing sales down $6 billion. Even over the last quarter, you're seeing sales at least flat. So not as bad as it has been in the past, but you're seeing that flattening out in those greater China sales. In terms of the other regions, America is continuing to modestly grow up a billion dollars. Europe continuing to put on $2.5 billion. Japan also growing right around 10%. And then rest of APAC up from 6.3 last year, now to 7.4 on the net sales. In terms of the iPhone sales specifically, this remains the bread and butter for this company. No matter what anyone tells you, the iPhone sales, yeah, continue to drive this business. Over the last quarter actually did relatively well 
up $3 billion over the last 12 months, you're basically flat on those iPhone sales. So probably this last quarter, some of that iPhone 16 shipments came through in this quarter, but I'd say a majority of those will come through in the current Q1 that we are in. And similarly, you're seeing a slowdown on the iPhone, pardon me, the MacBook sales, as you went from 7.6 up to just 7.7. .7. Some of that could be consumers holding out on upgrading their Macs as their new line of MacBook Pros were just announced this past week. So maybe a lot of that Mac movement or Mac upgrade cycle will again come in the upcoming Q1 that we are in. iPads continuing to do relatively okay. I would say nothing out of the ordinary $7 billion up from 6.4 last year. Over the last 12 months, you are seeing those iPad sales decline and then wearables continue to struggle as you're seeing those wearable sales also decline. They also announced new AirPod Pros, I believe, and new Apple Watches. And so maybe some of those continuing to just not resonate that well with customers, or maybe Apple needs to up the innovation that they're doing on the wearables, the home, and the accessories category is because the Apple Watch really not upgrading that much from one generation to the next. In fact, I'm still on the Series 3. So if that tells you something, yeah, I'm still on a Apple Watch from nearly six years ago. And so maybe that should tell you where the Apple Watch really sits. And the services business remains to be the bright spot as you have nearly $24.9 billion. And last year you were closer to 22.3. This did come in a bit lighter than what Wall Street was hoping for, but still remains to be a very, very nice bright spot from not just a top line net sales perspective, but I'm sure a lot of these sales go straight to the bottom line considering it's very, very software-like margins on that services business. Now, in terms of news stories, Apple is reducing its reliance on Broadcom in upcoming 2025 by developing their own in-house Wi-Fi chips, and they're expecting to produce nearly all of their in-house Wi-Fi chips within the next three years. So this move will reduce costs and enhance Apple's ecosystem integration advantages. So this news reminds me a lot of the news that they released when they were moving away from the Intel chips. And certainly if you are investing in these component makers like Intel or Broadcom and to a more degree, Sirius Logic, that specifically produce components for the Apple iPhone. Yeah, I would keep that in mind because Apple can suddenly move away from these component makers and start to produce everything pretty much in-house like they have been over the past as they did with those Intel chips. They moved away from those, started producing their own M chips or M1, M2, M4 chips in-house that are proving to be extremely, extremely beneficial. Now this probably is again bullish for TSMC because pretty much everything goes through TSMC that they're pretty much the only company out there that's able to manufacture all these components. And so still probably bullish for TSMC, probably not as bearish for Broadcom, but I think for other component makers that are pretty much fully reliant on sales from Apple, I think you should be cautious when investing in those because at any point, Apple certainly can reduce their reliance on those component makers. In fact, they probably have discussions every day on how they can reduce their reliance on those component makers. Now, earlier this week, in fact, yesterday, we got Apple revealing their line of new MacBook Pro models featuring the M4 chip. So this is the first MacBook Pro lineups which are built for Apple intelligence. That's why they're using the new M4 chip. Certainly my thoughts on the Mac is that these Macs are frankly really, really good. In fact, from personal experience, I'm still on the MacBook Pro with using the M1 chip. And so that one is, I think, nearly four or five years old at this point, I use it to record, I use it to edit, use it for pretty much everything every single day. And it's done me really, really well. So the upgrade times on these MacBook Pros, simply because they're so, so good, is probably a couple of years. And so that's why you're not seeing those MacBook sales nearly year over year growing as fast because people just simply can hold on to those MacBooks for a very, very long time. Now, the one thing that might differentiate this MacBook Pro lineup is the fact that it's on the M4 chip which again runs Apple intelligence, which maybe I think my Mac isn't able to do. So maybe if those Apple intelligence features are really, really breathtaking, that might have enough meat on the bone to convince consumers to go out and make the purchase. Now, Apple also exporting $6 billion of India made iPhones, again, pushing beyond China. So they're reducing the risk on manufacturing those iPhones straight out of China. They're instead going to the country of India and trying to produce more chips, pardon me, more phones there in 2024, they're on track to produce nearly $10 billion of annual exports in terms of iPhone sales. I think that's a good thing. I think you have a lot of geopolitical tension from China. And so certainly you're about a week away from the elections. 
depending on the results, you might have even further geopolitical tensions over with China. And so a push out of China into more India made iPhones, probably good for Apple to diversify their manufacturing in the region of Asia. You're also seeing iPhone lead times starting to moderate, but still being in line with the iPhone 15. This is something I would actually guess the fact that the iPhone 16 is out right now, but it doesn't have those Apple intelligence features at least probably coming today or tomorrow. But I think until those Apple intelligence features come through, I think the iPhone 16 pretty much is the same as the iPhone 15. And so I would expect it to sell very similarly. It's once those features are being rolled through and consumers really see what they're able to do with those AI features, that could be enough to push them to make the upgrade. But until then, I think you're seeing pretty much same sell through as you saw with the iPhone 15. And then lastly, you're seeing the Apple iPhone 16 being restricted from being sold in Indonesia as the company has yet to meet local investment requirements that is according to Bloomberg. So I think not a huge story, just the fact that you're probably seeing some of those Indonesia sales being excluded, at least for now. I think Apple certainly will find a workaround from this and eventually get those iPhones in the country of Indonesia. Now, if you are new to analyzing financials or new to looking at stocks and their numbers, I encourage you to open up the income statement for Apple it's one of the simplest that you can go through. You have your product sales of 69, call it $70 billion on the nose. A year ago, you were at $67 billion. We took a look at those services continuing to rise. And so you have total sales of nearly $95 billion. Again, for a quarter, for a quarter, that is absolutely crazy. For the last 12 months, you're close to $390 billion in net sales. The cost of sales continuing to relatively rise in line. As your sales for these physical goods continue to move up, your cost of sales also will continue to move up. What's impressive though, is the cost of sales on the services side, staying flat to the dollar on a year over year basis, staying at $6.5 billion, despite adding on close to 2 billion on your top line. So dollar for dollar, everything you earned additional on your top line services sales will go straight into your gross margins as those expanded roughly $3 billion year over year. So you're seeing margin expansion over at Apple due to that services business continuing to be extremely, extremely profitable. In terms of operating expenses, not a whole lot over at Apple. This company watches their costs and structure really, really well. And so you have nearly 14.2 in operating expenses. Last year, you were at 13.5. And so your operating income continuing to move up to nearly $30 billion. And then this company continues to buy back their shares as they reduce those shares outstanding, helping their EPS up to 97 cents on a diluted basis. So this company chugging right along in terms of the financials, you're seeing a little bit of growth on the product side, very nice growth on services, and then everywhere else, they're basically able to control those costs extremely, extremely nicely. From a year over year picture on the balance sheet, you still have close to 30 billion in cash, another 152 in total current assets. The inventory line, ticking up just modestly, I'd say from 6.3 up to 7.3. So some of that inventory is still sitting there in Apple. Some of that could just be iPhone 16s being held out for the holiday time period. But I think the fact that this inventory number is up meaningfully could have certain indications towards the sales of the upcoming iPhone 16. You don't have a whole lot of property, plant and equipment over at Apple. And then in terms of long-term debt, you have roughly 11 billion in short-term and then another 86, call it 87 billion in long-term debt. That is down significantly from a year ago. When we get to the cash flows, you'll see this is what investors really, really like about Apple is you have nearly $118 billion of operating cash flows over the last 12 months. And unlike Amazon that we just saw, this company isn't doing a whole lot of CapEx. You see just $10 billion of CapEx for the last 12 months. Yeah, $10 billion of CapEx over 12 months. We just saw Amazon do $22 billion of CapEx in the last three months. And so again, tells you the differentiated outlook that Apple is taking in terms of running their business. Instead, they're basically taking that $110 billion of free cash flow and handing it to you in the form of $95 billion of a buyback and $15 billion of a dividend. So again, tells you just the power that this company has in terms of what they can do with that free cash flow, they also pay down some long-term debt to the tune of $10 billion. So this company, again, very, very, very shareholder friendly. And one of the reasons why I think Warren Buffett continues to love his Apple investment is because they returned so much capital to him in the form of this $95 billion 
buyback. That is just absolutely absurd to wrap your head around buying back $95 billion of stock in a single calendar year. Moving on to the technicals, you're seeing the stock basically trading right around flat in the after hours. The conference call probably having started by this point. So you're seeing Tim Cook on there probably speaking those good words to investors that they wanted to hear. Over the last, call it, couple of years, this company has been in a straight line up, very predictable pattern of higher highs and higher lows. Anytime it comes down to this green line, that's your time to aggress aggressively, pardon me, step into shares because you're looking at a uptrend that started back in 2008 and it only comes down to that level probably a handful of times. Now we get in a bit closer, you are still trading up close to the top end, I'd say of this uptrending channel. And so I think you still have some downside with shares of Apple. You certainly have some resistance up here at call it 237. You've seen rejection there once and twice. And then you probably have support at I'd say $213 a share. That's probably a meaningful level of support with the shares of Apple. In the near term, you could make an argument that you are making a series of higher highs and higher lows. Not overly convincing because you've sort of just touched this once, maybe touched it twice before. And so from that perspective, if you are wanting to step into shares of Apple, you could maybe nibble at this point. I would actually wait for a further pullback though, closer to this 214, maybe even as low as 210 on shares of Apple. Until then though, I think you can absolutely continue to hold your shares. There's nothing in this report that told me. Otherwise, I think the iPhone 16 will still be very important to watch how sales are for that device. And then as the AI features roll out, we'll see how the MacBook Pro lines sell and certainly how those AI features are received from consumers. But I think until then, this company will continue to just buy back their stock, pay out that dividend and pay down debt. So as a shareholder, those are all things that you should probably be really happy about. And one of the reasons why you continue to own shares of Apple. Let me know your thoughts on this one in the comment section below. As always, thanks so much for listening and I'll catch you guys in the next video.